Yes. Dear Father in heaven, we pray that the word you have given our brother John Clements may be anointed by your spirit, in your spirit, and may touch the hearts of those that you want it to touch, Lord. All power and glory to your name, and all is of your doing and of your working. Help us to see it out in this world, in this place, in this time, now. We pray the Father, blessings of your, Jesus, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Well, we're continuing in our series of talks on the Lord's Prayer. And today, we're looking at just these three words. Your kingdom come. And uh, those are in Matthew 6 and verse 10, and also in Luke 11 and verse 2. The Bible is a book of hope. It looks not backwards, but forwards. It has its face turned towards the light. It always speaks of the best that is still to come. We open its, we open its pages and we read of Eden, of a time when the world was free from pain and sorrow and sadness because man was free from sin. While man was innocent, his home was a garden. All nature served him. A sky that was always blue smiled down upon him. And God was his familiar friend. But we read on further in the next few chapters and a change comes over the aspect of all things. Eden disappears. And has never been rediscovered. Joy, harmony and peace vanished. And left behind them discord sorrow and hate. When man sinned, pain and grief and death entered the world. Man's sky grew black with clouds. God no longer spoke with him in the cool of the evening. And he was driven out of the garden at the gates of which the chariot cherubim were placed with swords of flame which pointed every way as if to say, no return, no return. But even in the story of that bitter loss, I can detect the notes of hope. You perhaps remember the old Greek legend which says that when Pandora was married to oh, uh, I'm not very good at Greek Ephesimus the gods gave her a box which was full of winged blessings as a wedding present and as long as Pandora kept the box locked, so long life was like a summer's day. She and her husband enjoyed every blessing. But one day, tempted by curiosity, she opened the box. And on the instant, the little winged creatures who were locked inside, took flight and left her forever. All 
did I say? No, not quite all. Hope remained at the bottom of the box. The only blessing left to Pandora and her husband. And in, that, in exactly the same way, man lost everything by sin except hope. When God made man, he gave him every blessing. But when man unmade himself, these blessings took flight. He lost his innocence. He lost his peace. He lost his happiness. He lost his home. And he lost everything but hope. God left him hope to comfort him in his bitter grief. God left him hope to save him from despair. When man's night was blackest, God sent into his sky a star. A star that was the promise of the day to come. In pronouncing doom upon disobedient man, God also gave him a promise, as if to say, it shall not always be midnight and deep despair with you. Your day spring shall rise up. That note of hope struck, even in the story of the tragedy of the fall, is the keynote of the Bible. The Bible is a book of the future and the springtime and the dawn. You will not find its pages taken up with regrets for Eden, which has been lost. It looks forward to a better Eden still to come. It doesn't spend its time in bewailing the sunshine that has disappeared from the earth. It rather bids men wake and watch that they may be ready to greet the still more glorious day which is about to break. Come on, I think an hallelujah would be good there, wouldn't it? <laughs> For as you read the Bible, what do you discover? You discover one glowing promise after another given by God. You find hope ever growing stronger. You find the assurance that the night is departing, ever becoming more confident, until at last some prophet of keener vision than the rest catches on the peaks of the distant hills the inkling gloom of the dawn, beholds the vision of the light not of moon or stars, but of the sun, and announces to the world, sick with longing for the day, that light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. This is to the future, the Bible looks. From its first page to the last, it preaches the glad gospel of hope. The old Eden, which had been lost, is a prophecy of the better Eden to be gained. The golden age of the Bible is before, not behind. Paganism could only look back wistfully to the past and sigh for the reign of Saturn when the earth had peace and plenty. Those glad days which had been could never return anymore. Our good time is still to come. Our golden age is still in the womb of the future. We are still looking for that glorious last for which the first was made. 
This is the golden age to which the Christian looks forward that this second petition speaks. Your kingdom come. But we're so used to saying, thy will be, thy kingdom come. But today we say your kingdom, don't we? And it's a prayer for the good time coming. A prayer for the golden age. A, pray, a prayer for the better Eden. For the earth's golden age will come when God is king. I say the earth's golden age advisedly. Let me emphasize it. The earth's golden age. For many have misinterpreted the reference of this petition. Tertullian, the old Latin father, would have made his petition the third, not the second. He would have read the prayer like this. Hallowed be your name, your will be done, your kingdom come, because he thought this prayer for God's kingdom referred to the end of the world and the second advent. But when Jesus teaches us to pray that God's kingdom may come, he means that we are to pray that God may reign here on the earth, that men may acknowledge him as king, that life here may be regulated by his commands. This is not a prayer that may be taken out of earth into heaven, so that the earth itself may become heavenly. It is a prayer for the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. It is a prayer for the world's golden age, a golden age which will come when there is established here on earth the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and the joy in the Holy Ghost. Have you noticed how in most men's minds the idea of golden age is associated with the name of some king? The Israelites associated it with the name of David. The Germans associated with the name of Frederick Barbarossa. For us English people, a special hero of romance gathers around the time of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. And as a matter of fact, the world's good time is inseparably connected with the coming of a king and the establishment of a kingdom. But the kingdom is no earthly royalty. The king is no David or Barbarossa or Arthur come back to life again. The kingdom is the kingdom of God. And the name of the king is... Jesus! Jesus. Come on, the name of the king is... Hallelujah. When that kingdom is established, when the king is enthroned, a better Eden shall be here than the Eden we have lost. It is the world's evil time just now. The earth is full of misery and grief and pain. Many are the schemes propounded for mending matters. And God knows they need mending. Each man has his own remedy. Every quack his own pansier. But if we leave God and Christ out of the account, every plan is doomed to fail. We shall mend matters only by making God a reality. And the final establishment of right and justice, and you will come only when he is enthroned as king. 
But you may say to me, is God not king now? Is not the world his? Are not all men in his hands? This is perfectly true. I do not forget that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. It is my joy and strength to remember that in spite of all the bluster and brave show made by the forces of evil, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. But if you will examine the basis of that kingdom, you find it rests on God's creatorship. He is the Lord of the world and of men because... He created them. Because in him, they live and move and have their being. God wants to be king in Jesus Christ. That is to say, he wants to be king in virtue, not of his power, but of his love. Look at the prayer. Your kingdom come. Whose kingdom is it? Well, it is our Father's kingdom. Oh, this is a kingdom of love. God wants to be king, not because he is creator, but because he is Father. He wants men to be obedient to him, not under the pressure of force, but under the sweet constraint of love. God has been king by the title of creator since the world began. But he is not even king yet by the title of father. He is not even yet king in Jesus Christ. It is for this kingdom we are to pray, the time when men shall realise that God's fatherhood means, for the time when men's hearts shall be so touched by God's love for them in Jesus Christ, that out of pure and grateful affection, they will render him a willing and glad obedience. Your kingdom come. The prayer you will notice regards the kingdom as something still to come. But as yet, it is in the future. In other places in the New Testament, it's talked of and actually as being actually existent. Both views are true. The kingdom is both present and future. Remember that when the Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God should come, he observed in Luke 17 verses 20 to 21. Listen to this. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The Pharisees were treating as future what was already present. The kingdom of God was already in their midst. But it's not surprising that the Pharisees fail to discover the presence of the kingdom. It was a very tiny affair at the time. Its subjects were only a handful of Galilean peasants. Our Lord himself speaking of the tiny, 
unnoticed beginning of the kingdom, said it was like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. The kingdom is not hidden today. The leaven has been working through the centuries. The presence of the kingdom is the most noticeable fact in the world's life today. We talk about the great empires of the world. We talk about the former British Empire, which embraced one-fifth part of the habitable globe. And the great Russian Empire claim a sixth part of the world. And the German Empire, and the French Empire, and the rest of them. But there's one empire greater mightier than any other the empire of king jesus hallelujah it is in our midst the mightiest kingdom the most potent force on earth and yet while the kingdom of god is thus present and potent it is still future its full realisation has yet to come. So long as there is in this world one man or one woman who has not yielded their heart to Christ, so long as there is a single department of life which is not brought into subjection to the law of Christ, so long that kingdom be unrealised. So long shall we need to pray this prayer. Your kingdom come. All the misery of this world is due to the fact that there are multitudes of men and women still in rebellion. That there are whole departments of human activity which are not regulated by the Spirit of Christ. The kingdom is still imperfect and incomplete. Its full establishment lies in the future somewhere. Until that full establishment takes place, until God is king everywhere and over everybody and everything, the world's golden age will never come. What kind of kingdom is it? It is worthwhile noticing that kingdom occupied a large place throughout the speeches of Christ. His gospel was the gospel of the kingdom. He announced that he had come to find a kingdom he claimed the title king for himself. And in what is known as the Sermon of the Mount, we have had a series on the Sermon on the Mount, so do look up and listen to those sermons again if you missed them. He gave us, shall I say, the laws and rules of the kingdom. Christ was not the first to picture an ideal state. Plato had already done that in his Republic. But Plato's picture would not satisfy you or me. It is an impossible, fantastic dream. Plato's state, with its philosopher king and its destruction of the family, repels instead of attracting us. But the kingdom of God, which Christ has pictured for us, that gleaming vision of a new earth in which love shall rule, fascinates and enthralls us. And the hope of its realisation becomes the mainspring of all human progress and attainment. So what kind of kingdom is it? 
Let me answer in the words of the great apostle Paul and say, the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. There you have in one brief sentence the characteristics of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is righteousness. Or in other words, the kingdom of God is justice. There is a cruel wrong in this world of ours, wrong that daily cries up to God for vengeance. Man wrongs man, brother oppresses his brother. The dark places of the earth are full of cruelty. And places like that are usually supposed to be light, like this favoured England of ours, are full of cruelty also. Oh, my friends, to see the wrong, the oppression, the wickedness of life is a maddening sight. I can understand how men and women are sometimes driven by it into the blasphemy of despair. But the kingdom of God is justice, strict level, even-handed justice. When his kingdom comes, tyranny, oppression and wrong shall cease. Men shall do right out of love for their righteous king. The kingdom of God is peace. Peace between men. Peace between nations. All strife and mutual distrust shall be forever buried. And the noise of war shall be heard no more. But men shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Hate and enmity shall die. <coughs> Listen to this. Isaiah 65 and verse 25, we read these words. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The kingdom of God is joy. We are in the winter of discontent just now, aren't we? Life is full of tears and grief and pain. The tears and grief and pain spring from the hate and the impression and the injustices of life from us. But when God is king, there should be justice and peace. Joy will follow as a natural consequence. Justice and peace and joy. Is not this the kingdom of God worth praying for? Are we doing it? Oh, I have a longing in my heart. Have you? To see this kingdom come. Then God's entrusting it to you and me. Now let me go on to ask the question, what is the sphere of the kingdom? First, let me say, the sphere of the kingdom is the individual hearts. When I pray, your kingdom come, I do not feel that I'm praying solely for the work of foreign missions, for example. I do not think only uh, of the millions of non-believers in China or India or Africa. When I pray, your kingdom come, I'm not satisfied with adding to the thoughts of the heathen abroad or the heathen at home. No. When I answer that fit prayer, 
I feel I'm praying for myself. I'm praying that God's kingdom may come in my own heart. Oh yes, this prayer has reference to ourselves. When we pray, your kingdom come, we pray, Lord, come into our own hearts. Rule there, take the throne there. Make us completely yours, Lord. Your kingdom come. My friends, do we really mean it? Do we honestly desire it? To see what it means. It means that we're asking that every cherished sin and passion may be cast out of our hearts. It means that we desire that neither money, nor pleasure, nor fame should have any power over us or draw away from God. It means that God's will and not our own may rule. Oh, that's a prayer. Do we honestly and sincerely mean what we say? I've known men who have lost, who have loved their sins too much, their pleasures, their money, themselves too much, even to be able to pray sincerely, your kingdom come. Oh, may God give us grace, honestly, to pray this prayer. May he make us able and willing to give to him, to give to his commands the glad and complete obedience. God's kingdom must come in our own hearts before it can come to the world at large. It is only true and loyal subjects of the kingdom who can extend its boundaries and further its interests. Men and women will not enter the kingdom. Then we must preach to them. When? Until doomsday. We must never give up if we ourselves remain without. But if God truly reigns in our hearts and his kingdom produces in us righteousness, peace and joy, we shall then be able to go forth and win others as loyal subjects to our king. But in offering this prayer, we must not stop at ourselves. The prayer embraces the the wide world in its sweep. Your kingdom come where? Everywhere. All nations are to bow down before him. All people are to serve him. Men discuss the question sometimes as to which race is likely to become the dominant race on the earth. We people who live in this little island are inclined to believe that this splendid destiny is reserved for us Anglo-Saxons. We stand among the nations for the principles of liberty and truth and justice. And as I recently heard a pastor say some months ago, we believe that the momentum of these ideas will carry us to the government of the earth. And so far as England does stand for those great ideals, I'm not ashamed to confess I'm an English imperialist. But there is something I'm more anxious about even than the domination of England. And that is the domination of Christ. Above everything else, I'm a Christian imperialist. Are you? 
I want to see the banner of the cross floating over every land. I want to see every nation acknowledging one and the same king, even Jesus. I want to see the crown of the world on the brow, which bears the crown of the world, and which still bears the, star, the scars of the crown of thorns. And my friends, I know that all this shall come to pass. The place of England in the future of the world is, after all, a matter of conjecture. But there is no conjecture, no doubt, no perhaps about the place of Christ. He is destined for the throne. He shall reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Your kingdom come in my own heart over all the world. Let me add in every department of life. When we pray this prayer, we are praying that God may rule in our business life, in our social life, and in our political life. We're asking him to preside in our parliaments and council chambers. We're asking him to take the government of our markets and our offices and exchanges. We're asking him to be Lord in the realms of art and literature. What an enormous sweep this prayer has as an exclamation. And we must not only pray this form of words, but that our prayer is not to be a sham and a pretense. We must toil, toil to realise the kingdom, the old Latin proverb. Do you know it? To labour is to pray. Yeah? To labour is to pray. At any rate, no one has truly prayed this prayer who does not bend all his energies to the task of seeking to establish this kingdom on earth. England keeps in every important foreign town consuls to look after the interests of English people. Let me use that as an illustration to the duties of Christian people. We are in this world to look after the interests of God in his kingdom. We are his consuls, your fathers and mothers in the homes. You are there to look after God's interests and promote his kingdom. We must all be faithful to our calling, so live and work that God's kingdom may come. No wish or prayer of ours can make the summer come an hour before its time or stave off what, by one hour the approach of a grim winter. But it does depend upon our prayers and labours, whether it shall be soon or late, that summer gladness shall come into the souls of men and women whether it shall be soon or late, that Christ shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. I've nearly finished, but these are important words. You might like to listen to the tape later. Let me know, now proceed to the question, how is this kingdom established? Let me first say, how it cannot, it cannot be established by force. Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon built up their empires with a sword and cemented them with blood. But not so is the kingdom of God to be established. Men have tried that method. They've used fire and sword 
to make God's kingdom come. Peter had that spirit when he pointed to the two swords the disciples possessed. Muhammad followed this plan when he gave to men the alternative, either Islam or death. The Crusaders, spurred on by the burning eloquence of Peter the Hermit, committed the same blunder. The old Saxon and Gothic kings, who when they accepted Christianity themselves, compelled their people to be baptised as well. They followed the same mistaken method. But these people did not advance the kingdom of God one whit. You do not make a man a member of the kingdom by baptising him or enrolling him among the adherents of a church or by calling him a Christian. Men must have their hearts changed. They must be born again. They must be willing to render glad obedience to their father king before they become members of this kingdom. Force may increase the numbers of a sect. It cannot add one to the membership of the kingdom. The sword may compel a man to change his name. It could never compel him to change his heart. Oh no, it is not by the sword that God's kingdom will come. To all ecclesiastical persecutors, Christ says, put the sword up in its scabbard. Not by the sword is the kingdom to come, but by the cross. Constantine of old, when on the eve of that critical battle, dreamed he saw a cross in the sky, and around it the legend came, by this we conquer. That is the weapon we have to use in our warfare. That is the weapon whereby God's kingdom is to be established. We are to conquer by the cross. We are to conquer by the power of love. For the cross means love. Love at its best. The cross is the power of God. It is by the story of the cross that men's hearts are to be broken and their affection and allegiance won. By this we conquer is the charge given to us. Preach the cross. Elevate the dying redeemer of men. When we lift him up, what do we say? He says, I will draw all men to me. That's my prayer for this church. We might lift him up. Your kingdom, nearly finished. Your kingdom come. This is a prayer for today. But the time will come when the prayer shall be changed into praise. And we should be able to say, your kingdom has come. It has been coming for over 1900 years. And it is not here yet. But doubt not, despair not, faint not, it shall come. Men have called the visions such as Plato and Sir Thomas More have given us the ideal state, utopias, nowheres, to mark the idea of those visions as fantastic, impractical and impossible. But let no one dare to call the kingdom of God a utopia. Let no one dare to say of the new earth which Christ foretold that it is all in vain, an impossible dream. To say that is to deny the faith and to be guilty of the great apostasy. Do you say that the establishment of a kingdom 
justice and peace and joy is impossible? I will tell you, no. God is pledged to it. And he shall not fail, nor be discouraged. For time is coming when our evil hearts shall be made pure and clean. The time is coming when asylums and penitentiaries and jails shall no longer openly proclaim our shame. The time is coming when the drunkard and the decadent and the criminal and the harlot shall be no more. But the people shall all be righteous, a branch of God's planting, that he may be glorified. The time is coming when trade in politics and pleasure shall be carried on to the glory of God. The time is coming when literature and art shall be cleansed of all impure smear. And just speak of God as the Bible speaks of him today. The time is coming when every idol shall be broken and every superstition destroyed and the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. The time is coming when righteousness, peace and joy shall everywhere prevail and sin and wrong shall be words whose meaning men no longer understand. So let's lift up our hearts. That glorious time is coming. That glorious day is about to break. The world is grey with morning lights. Your kingdom come. <coughs> it, it must come. It will come. It is coming. And it doesn't depend on you and me. This is why I'm for sure. But upon the risen and exalted Christ, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Amen. <coughs> We're going to sing a lovely chorus hymn now. And the offering will be taken. If you like, we can sing it more than once. I hope it's the right tune. It's number 655. The Lord is a great and mighty king. I hope we know it. 655. <coughs> Let us praise him all day. 